Church, will you join me in welcoming the entire planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas? Y'all, this is the Open Door Experience. Boom! Well, a little bit of celebration there. A great big God bless you to everybody that's here from out of state, folks that are watching all over the world. I want to say a great big hello to our Houston campus. Everybody say hello, Houston campus. Yeah, man, we bless you guys. Call y'all blessed. Friends, ha <clears throat> ha, hairball, still there, ha <laughs> ha. Guys, today we're going to get into part five of my message series. It's called Reset. We're going to be talking about, okay, look, sometimes you just got to just reset things and go, okay, this has gone too far, or I need to get reignited, or I need to repent, right? The whole thing of re, right? Friends, I want to start off here today talking about a famous shipwreck, and talk about how in the world did that happen. And I'm talking about the ship that's called the USS Huron. I want to take you back now to November the 23rd of the year 1877. Not very long after the Civil War, less than 12 years after the Civil War that tore America to pieces, the last of the great steam naval ships and the last of the great iron hulled ships before it went to steel, the USS Huron leaves port and heads south towards Cuba. The last that you're ever going to see of its kind, which means it was the best of the best of the best of the best that the day had to offer. Not only that, but the Huron's captain represented the brightest of his day, and he had actually taught navigation at West Point Naval Academy. I mean, the brother had his act together, and because he knew he had all the answers, he began to ignore warnings of there was a serious storm that was coming. And he's like, he took one look at his boat, and he, took, he said, no, we can do this. And while I really admire his courage and I, I admire his tenacity, then there was another problem where they, were, where they were held in a port for way too long and he finally just said, let's go. And he got out of there. He got, he got very frustrated and he said, look, we got to get to Cuba. And a combination of a whole bunch of minor mistakes turned into something disastrous because what he did not know is that there was a tiny one degree error in the ship's brand new compass which means as they were steaming south, it was one degree off and he was actually going to the right a little bit. And since it was a big storm, he couldn't see that he was getting closer and closer to the reefs. Well, in fact, within 24 hours after they left, the Huron would sink just 200 yards off the coast of Virginia and 98 men would lose their lives to the waves and to the terrible current. Now the warning bells rang and the captain saw the rocks of the reef directly ahead. And when he saw that, there was no way that they could stop in time. He commanded his men to brace themselves. And his last recorded words were this, my God, how did we get here? Now, I've been in that several times in my life. If you've lived long enough, my friends, you have too. Where you just got into a place, you go, whoa, 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 I, I didn't see this coming. I, I had a plan, I had a strategy, everything was going the way it was supposed to, and now this disastrous thing is happening, and I don't know how we got here. And sometimes it's very traumatic, like it is something disastrous, and sometimes, man, you just look up and you go, I don't have the zeal and the strength that I used to have. I used to be on fire for Jesus. How did I get here? I used to be so full of hope. How did I get here? I was on track. How did I get off track? How did I get off track with my marriage or my relationship with my kids? Or dude, if, you, if you've lived like me your whole life, my finances has just been a solid roller coaster. Woo woo, woo woo, woo woo, woo woo, woo woo, woo woo, right? And just like, and you just sometimes just tank and sometimes you have what I like to call a faith quake. You know a faith quake? Where everything that you thought was based upon an outcome and when the outcome doesn't happen, you think, I, I don't understand even my faith anymore. Amen? Are you with me on that? Listen, that's normal Christianity. That is normal humanity in the midst of heaven invading earth that you will get to places where the Lord is going to reveal to you. You think that this is rock solid. It's rock solid within certain perimeters, but if you get into that, it's not rock solid at all, and we're going to have to have a reset. Have you ever experienced that place where you just looked up and you said, I, I thought I understood this. I thought it was right. I, I thought I was fully equipped. My God, how did I get here? Well, I do not wish that upon anybody. I know for a fact that it happens to everybody. 
And guys, we have to know how to be able to find the Lord and how to be able to answer that question in that place. I had a job and I had a career and I lost it. I had a joy, I had the joy of the Lord and I lost it. I had great prayer life. I was having dreams. I was seeing miracles and I lost it. How did I get here in this place? Raise kids, fall in love with Jesus. Then you turn them over to some socialist professor. And in a matter of six weeks, they don't even love Jesus anymore. And they question your faith. And you say, my God, how did we get here? You need to be able to answer that question. And you need to be able to reset. There's a story in the Bible that tells us exactly the importance of finding the lost thing that you don't think that you would ever find again. The theme of finding lost things has actually been uh, a big spiritual theme with me. And I, I'm sure that you have certain things in your walk with Jesus that are peculiar to you, and you keep seeing this thing over and over and over again. And one of those is throughout my entire walk with King Jesus, when people tell me they lost a ring or they've lost this or have lost that, I've prayed and said, Lord, do what you do and make it miraculous. And then within just a few hours, they might call me and say, I found that ring, right? Finding lost things is like a really big deal to me. Finding coins everywhere. Are there any weirdo coin finding people in here and you know that that's a you and Jesus thing? Oh, see, there's a couple of you. Some of y'all are scared of what I just said. Oh, that's weird. That ain't weird. We can show you weird. <laughs> But just like everywhere you go, there's a coin on the ground. Everywhere I go, there's a coin on the ground. Everywhere I go. And I think of the parable that says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure hidden in the field. And for the joy thereof, he sells all that he has and he purchases it. It's kind of like the Lord saying, this is why I wanted you to sell out so that you could have this treasure. And the treasure doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the value of people that the world sees no value in whatsoever. It's a treasure hidden in a field. There are so many people, friends, that the world does not celebrate, but heaven does celebrate. The selfless old lady who can only give what the Bible calls a widow might. A little, penny, a little teeny tiny piece of a penny that a widow could give. And Jesus says, wow, look at what an extraordinary giver she is. Everybody's like, dude, I ain't, why would you celebrate that? You know, did you not do good in math, King Jesus? Oh, I did great, actually. Sure did. And here's the deal, pickle. That lady right there is giving more than anybody else that you see because that's all she has. She's all the way in. You need to know, man, that there's many ways that you're selflessly serving King Jesus that the world is never going to celebrate. Quit looking for the world's approval and serve an audience of one, King Jesus. Amen. So there's all kinds of really cool weirdo prophets um, in the Old Testament. One, things I, one of the things I can tell you about prophets and missionaries is they're all weirdos. Now, I like weirdos. And, uh, I, you know, deep calls into deep, right? So the weirdo in me calls out to the weirdo in others. And uh, I like people that are just plain strange. I do. Um, I, I enjoy those kinds of people. I like people that are rock solid and you understand them and all that. Like I have a whole bunch of friends who are professional cowboys and, you know, they kind of have the personality of, this, of the, this piece of plastic right here on this glasses. And I like those guys. You know, they just keep to themselves. They work hard. They have, inc they have an incredible ethic. They got the old Texas culture thing. I love that very, very, very much. But I also like some people that like Daffy Duck on Ridlin. I like those people. I, I very much like people too that are just so far out of the box and just such weirdos, like Leanna. Like, oh, oh, look at you. Y'all are so sensitive. You've been so trained to be sensitive. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like me, I promise you. So, you know, like, like we have we have two donkeys, okay? We have a Jane and Allen, right? Well, we have several businesses, and Leanna named all of our businesses Jane Allen, because that's what you do, right? And then she fixed up her daggum she shed, and she had a painting made of the donkeys, and her entire wallpaper is different colors of that same painting. And I'm like, do you, don't you love it? Isn't it amazing? That's a humdinger, honey. 
I mean, I'm all for having animal heads on the wall, just not these weird eccentric colors of our two living donkeys out there. She just thinks it's the greatest thing on planet Earth. And I have learned just to walk in and go, woo, woo, that's so loud, it gives me a headache. She's like, that's what I wanted to do. Well, there's this weirdo Old Testament prophet that's really the Rodney Dangerfield of all the prophets because he gets no respect whatsoever. God, I, I miss Rodney Dangerfield. Like, I don't like him. He wasn't saved. You don't know if he was saved or not. You leave him alone. I, do, you know, do you know that he was a child sex slave? Did you know that about him? See, man, you, you don't know people. And, and you can't just sit around and judge people. What's real is he was a true child sex slave. His little boy body was sold over and over and over again. And he's not known for being the most miserable person. He's known for being one of the funniest people. I love him. He's an overcomer. Ah, oh, yeah. I don't know if you can clap for that because it's not one of the Gaithers. You can clap for Rodney Dangerfield. It's okay. Right on. We bless him. I hope and pray that somebody had the courage to share Jesus with him. Amen. But, oh, man, when old Rodney Dangerfield get up there with Johnny Carson, I'll tell you what, that's some of the greatest stuff I ever saw in my life. And I know it wasn't appropriate, but I love things that are not appropriate. <laughs> I about to start telling Rodney Dangerfield jokes because I can think of so many. But there's actually an Old Testament prophet that is just like him. He gets no respect no matter what. And it's Elisha. Now, Elijah the prophet, Elijah the prophet, is like, you respect me or you die. You know what I'm talking about, right? The prophet of fire, you didn't call him a liar, Elijah. He used to sing that song. And dude, he'd say, well, if I be a man of God, meaning... If I'm the real deal, then let real fire come down and just consume my enemies. And then he starts kind of backing up a little bit, going, it's about to get hot. <laughs> Elisha, who did twice as, many, twice as many miracles as Elijah did, there are eight biblical recorded miracles of Elijah, and there's 16 recorded miracles of Elisha. And so you would think that he got twice as much respect. I'm just telling you, he just never does. He never does. And he has a hard ministry and he has a hard life. And even, you know, even when they went to bury him, they threw him in a, a grave and they didn't cover him up. And there's 15 recorded miracles up to the time that Elisha got thrown into this open grave. And then sometime you're like, oh man, he missed it by one. He missed it by one. No, he didn't because I don't know, maybe a month, maybe a year. I don't know exactly what the time frame is, but there was a battle that was going on. And then in the midst of the battle, um, some guys got slain and they was like, hey, our buddy, man, we need to put him in the ground. Well, there's an open grave right over here. And they threw his dead body into that open grave. And when that dead body hit the dry bones of Elisha, he rose up from the dead. There was still enough power. There was still enough anointing within him to literally raise somebody from the dead. I mean, yeah, but cool funeral? No, nothing. Now, this Elisha had extraordinary miracles. There were some really cool things that happened. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 5, we see the principle of the reset in a really cool, unusual miracle. And it says this, But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Let me just stop and let's just kind of set this story up. And again, guys, we are in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 5 and 7. And the Bible talks about they all went down to the river and they were going to cut the trees that were growing out over the river, right? And while they went there, it wasn't like you could go down to Home Depot and go get a chainsaw. Man, a, an axe head was a family heirloom because there was very few smelters on the, on the whole planet Earth, and especially in iron, because most people at this time were still in the Bronze Age. And to have an iron axe head... That's like being 500 years ahead of everybody else. The Philistines were actually into the Iron Age while the rest of Israel was into the Bronze Age. And that's one of the reasons why they feared them because if you held up a bronze shield to an iron sword, the iron sword would go through the, broad, would go through the bronze shield. And it was a really big deal. It, it was King David that turned that around, right? It's one of the reasons why he took Goliath's sword because it, the technology that was in it, it was a much stronger, I mean, you've gone from iron 
into steel, right? Well, this was, I'm sorry, from bronze into iron, and then after that is a steel age. So, so they had this iron axe head, and it's a big deal. And so they went, some, some guy said, look, I want to go down there and work, and I heard that you got one of those really cool iron axe heads. And they say, well, do, but I want it back. I said, okay. And he puts a stick through it, and he goes down, there and he's chopping, 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 and he does like this, and it goes off into the river. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but people didn't know how to swim back then. Even all the way into the Roman culture, where there's baths everywhere. You know why they built baths? Because they, there, there was no swimming culture on the planet Earth. So it, it, people didn't swim. You think about all of those amazing people that jumped on ships and came over here to the other side of the world. None of them were swimmers. They didn't swim. They're like, wow. Everybody just say wow to that. So if it wasn't a river, it was in the river. There was no such thing as just diving down, looking around, and coming back up. Because pe- folks didn't swim. So, like, what are we going to do? So they go to the man of God. And they said, look, I dropped the axe head. Like, I, I don't even know how this happened. I'm going to I'm gonna have to go to that family and say, I've lost the most precious tool that you have. And I was trying to do a good thing, man. I mean, I was, I was trying to help. I was, I was, you know, I was trying to be a blessing. I was in the game, man. This was it. And now this horrible disaster has happened. Verse 6, so the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And then he cut off a stick, threw it in there. And as they were watching the stick float, the iron head began to float. Floating iron head. Like, well, that's just a ridiculous miracle. I'm going to have to start me a dadgum internet page and show everybody how stupid that is. Yeah, I like what the King James says. And the iron head did swim. Not only did it float, it starts going, doo, 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 doo. oh, weirdo miracle. Weirdo. You know that Jesus will do weirdo miracles, right? Come on. So, so he reached out his hand and he took it. Friends, I'm going to show you that there's three steps in this process that has to do with the reset of When you have found yourself in a place like, how did this happen? My God, how did I get here? I have lost something that is so valuable. And I can't, I I have to have the courage to go into this place and move forward from there. I can't just avoid that place anymore. Because that's the first thing that the Lord is going to say to you is let's go back to the place. Let's go to the shack. Let's go to the place where the worst thing that you can possibly imagine happened and meet me in that place and we're not going to move forward unless you will meet me in that place friends I want to just tell you this it is so important that you and I get so comfortable with how much the father loves us and be guys that we just get so real with the goodness of God within our life that we don't spend our life trying to avoid the places where we have experienced great loss but actually let the Lord say So where do you think you lost it at? You remember when you were a happy kid once? How long has it been since you've been happy? Uh, Where do you think you lost that at? Meet me in that place. Oh, you know that you used to trust people? Man, you don't trust anybody anymore. Where do you think you lost that at? Show me the place. You show me the place where you lost it. Oh, no, I could never do that. I could never show you that. Lord, that's a shameful thing to me. Mm -hmm. Well, you're his bride. And if the Lord is saying, you know what? I'm not ashamed of you. Take me to that place and show me. Aren't you somebody who comes before the Lord and you say, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see what nobody else sees. Well, the Lord comes to us and says, show me what you won't show anybody else. Take me to that shameful place that you're scared of. Where did you lose it? What happened? Brother King David had experienced this in the presence of the Lord over and over again. And he said, even if I make my bed in hell, there you are. He said, I've decided to set you continually before me all the days of my life. And I want to see you, Lord. I want to. Now, for victims, this place is all about the forces beyond our control, those who have more, and the big guy picking on the little guys. Well, I'll tell you where I lost it. It was somebody that had more money than me. It was somebody that had a bigger house. It was somebody that was smarter than me, and it ain't fair. Okay, you're never going to recover what you lost. You're never going to move forward. 
You're always going to be a zero instead of a hero in that place because you, because you can't be real enough with God when God says, show me the place where you lost it. Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? Well, I'm hiding because I could hear that you were coming and what's real is I'm just not dressed to meet you. He says, I'm actually naked. And he said, who told you that? Because I have never spoke anything into your life to make you ashamed. Who told you that now you're in the business of hiding shameful things to me? Who told you that? You've been talking to a snake boy. Friends, the first thing that God Almighty will do, if you will admit, I need a reset and I've lost something that's incredibly valuable to me. I, I, I've lost my heart. I've lost my passion. I've lost my zeal. I've lost any of that. It's he's going to say, where did it happen? Where did you lose it? And if you can't get past that, you'll never get into the second and the third phase. And I want to just tell you, man, you can trust Jesus. And I'm sorry for whatever painful and terrible thing has happened. I, I truly am. I'm not making fun of you. I, I'm amazed at what people go through. And I fear the Lord when it comes to the hurts and the grief of other people. You don't mess with people's grief. I, you just don't know. Now that I've said that, I'm telling you this. You can be an overcomer. And the Lord will cause a miracle that you could never imagine to take place. Wouldn't you imagine that, that this man who had lost the axe head when he went and got the prophet, I would have thought, do your prayer and the Lord will split the water. Because that had already happened at the Jordan. He did that with Elijah and he also did that with Elisha. Yeah. He's like, okay, split the water, cause it to be dry and find it. He says, no, I don't think I'll do that. I just think I'll make it be a champion in the environment that it's already in. Do you know that God Almighty will give you a victory and cause you to become a champion in the environment that you're already in? If you're somebody that has a shameful past of drug abuse, do you know that God Almighty will put a spirit of freedom on you and you'll be able to set other people free? And because you don't put on a religious mask and you're vulnerable and you say, no, no, listen, I was on drugs or I did have this or I was a part of that. But here's what's real. Redemption has come to me and such as I have, I give unto you. Because you do that, He'll cause you to swim in the places you've sank. But Lord, I sank bad. I know. It was a train wreck. It was actually very impressive, Troy. But I'm going to cause you to swim in the place where you sank. You know, maybe you're somebody who's saying, maybe I, I haven't held, I haven't been holding myself responsible for my own zeal for my own passion for Jesus. Man, there's something wrong with me. And I want to tell you, I do this all the time. I feel it. There are times, guys, when I've had the glory of the Lord upon me, and I feel like I'm just going to go to heaven any minute. And there's other times I don't even, I don't even feel like I'm saved. You're like, oh, oh, you're a pastor. You can't be like that. Dude, I'm a dude who is madly in love with King Jesus, and I had to fight my own humanity like everybody else does, and this brother is victorious. I got some big-time victory in my life, but it's not without a battle. It's certainly not without a battle, man. This is the fight. I've learned not to trust my feelings. I have learned not to trust my own wicked heart that wants to deceive me. Amen. I've learned. Like, man, I you know, I've learned to fight the imposter syndrome that I, I have felt so many times standing behind this pulpit and go, man, I don't feel, I, I don't deserve to be up here. And there's so much, people in this room are so much more godly than me and they know more about the Bible than, they, than I do. And they, they love Jesus in a greater way than I do. No, I have to fight that. You have to fight that. And you're like, no, Pastor Troy, that's absolutely ridiculous. No, that's, that's humanity is what that is. And the Lord is not ashamed of my humanity. And I want to tell you, there's times that I have sank, but he's caused me to swim in the places I've sank. He's caused people, he's caused me to be right, right this second. Guys, we, there, there are people in 200 nations on the planet Earth watching me preach behind this pulpit. When there are years and years and years, I just spend all night long throwing up 
I don't want to preach tomorrow. Please don't make me preach tomorrow. I don't want to preach tomorrow. Please, please, please. I, I don't want to. And I know, that's, I know it's weak, and I know it's pathetic, but I've sank. But it'll cause you to swim in the place that you sank. If you'll be real with him when he asks you, where, where did you lose that? Just go, okay. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where did you lose it? Where did you lose that? Remember therefore where you have fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You know what it means for the Lord to remove his lampstand? It means, are you ready? You ready for this? It means you lose his manifest presence. You don't see God move anymore. And you'll be one of those Christians who can only believe that God used to do great things and that someday God is going to do great things, but you don't believe that he wants anything to do with your life today because you cannot see him anywhere. Everybody say, yikes. Yeah, I'm telling you. All right, here's number two, and it's the power of displacement. So here's what he does. He says, okay, take me to the spot where you lost it. And he takes him to the spot where he lost it, and he gets there in that place. And then he's like, okay, this is a spot. He says, yes, this is, this is where I made the dumbest mistake I've ever made. This is where I should have been paying attention. This is, where, this is where I shouldn't have lost it on my watch, this place. It's this place. He says, okay. And it doesn't work? He says, no. Well, let's throw in something that does work. And he takes a stick. And he throws it in there and says, now watch that stick float. Now this, is a, this is a big deal because how things work in the kingdom is through the power of displacement. Like what does that mean? It means this, that you don't just try and get rid of fear. You replace fear with praise and worship. See, this is, see you're not a Buddhist. A Buddhist, a Buddhist will say, I need to empty myself of everything. And then you open yourself up to demon possession. That's what Jesus said. If you empty the house and don't fill it up, there's going to be seven times more devils show back up. Right? And you don't want to do that. You don't want to empty yourself. What you want to do is fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. You want to get filled, and then you want to displace whatever is not a part of the Holy Spirit. That's what you want to do. So you go to the place where you lost it, and you throw in something that works the way it's supposed to. Amen. I, I was just thinking about applying the cross, the wood, right? Applying the cross, applying the word, proclaiming, and looking at what does work. There's this, there's this thing that's called beholding and becoming, that the thing that you look at is the thing that you become, right? There's lots of scriptures on that, and I'll give it to you here in just a minute. Well, here's one. Here's one. What you behold is what you become. Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we're changing into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it says, okay, here's the deal. God will show up, and he shows up in the mirror. And says, you see what I look like here? You see this change? Like, yes, sir. Now look at you. Boom. Okay, now I'm changing. I'm going from glory to glory. From his image to his image. And it's this principle of beholding and becoming that the thing that I look at for a long time is the thing that I become. I, it's, this is the kingdom, and this is the word of God. Okay, if you want to see that same exact verse in another translation, it says, our faces are no longer covered as we look at the glory of the Lord. As we look at the glory of the Lord, we're changed. We reflect more and more of his image by the power of the Spirit working on our hearts. And that's how that works. So instead of looking at the loss, you look at what works. And say, so, okay, here's the deal. I have experienced the spirit of the orphan. And the spirit of the orphan is after America. It's after America. And it says this, you are fatherless. You have been abandoned. Uh, and here's what Jesus says. I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. And you got to get that. You have to know, man, that the Lord will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And if, if, and if you're looking at all the people that have left you, all the people that didn't make it, all the people that promised that they would love you and they didn't, all the people that should have celebrated you and all they did was ridicule you, all the people that should have loved your freedom but all they did was try and control you, if that's all you can see, I want to tell you something. You're going to end up being exactly like that. 
And you don't want to do that. Here's what you want to see. I have seen how the Lord has been with me in places where I was abandoned and he did not abandon me. I have seen in places where I have been ashamed and alone, but I didn't find myself alone. I found myself in the presence of the Lord and I see him there. And let me tell you what, how he looks to you in that place is how you start to look to other people. So man, you take, you take that stick and you throw it in there and say, I'm no longer looking at the lost. Now I'm looking at the gang. That's what you got to do. If you've lost your strength, I want to just tell you, like, I, I just don't feel like I have strength anymore. Number one, get your head out of the lap of Delilah and quit listening to the media over and over and over and over and giving you new things to be afraid of every single day. In the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear for the things that they see coming up on the earth. Well, you want to be full of hope or you want to die of a heart attack? Come on. Do you know what it means when it says a, a man's heart fails him? It means he has no more courage. He has no more strength. Psalms 34 verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of all of them. How many? All of them. There is a deliverance for you no matter what. Well, I, don't, I just don't even believe that. I don't even, I don't even think that that's true. Well, okay, that's because you're looking at something that isn't God. And you have to know what the Word of God says. You have to know, what, you, you, you have to know the promises of, of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, and they shall not overflow you. You will not, you will not be overwhelmed. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And no flame, nor shall the flame scorch you. He's not saying that you're not going to go through hell. He's just saying it just doesn't matter. You're going to go through it. You're going to go through the fire. You're going to go through the water. You're going to go through stuff. So, yeah, but it ain't going to overwhelm you. But it's overwhelmed every single person in my family. They have been overcome. Yeah, but you're a bad motor scooter. The presence of the Lord is with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a, for, a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. So what's real is there's a way that I can find God in this hell that I'm going through here that's going to change me for the rest of my life. And I want to be so much better at the end of this thing. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, hey, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, that there's a place that you and I can find when we're in a dark place, that it's okay, the Lord's got our back. He's behind us. He's no longer in front of us. Now he's gone behind us and he's speaking into our, ear, into, our, into our own spiritual hearing. And he's saying, go ahead and take a few more steps here. Hey, why don't you, why don't you turn right just a little bit? Hey, why don't you turn left a little bit? Just walk with me because you're not going to remember the darkness. You're going to remember how I was with you. Hallelujah. Psalms chapter 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall... He should not be utterly cast down. I want you to think about that. He's like, look, go, go, go. Well, Lord, Lord, you told me to go this way. I did. And then there was a train wreck. And he's like, well, then get up. He says, even if you fall, do you know what, you know what the Lord would say to you? Get up. What are you laying there for? Because I fell. He's like, so? It's the way. <laughs> but it can't be the way if I fall. Dude, you don't know the Lord. You need to know him. Listen, his highest value for you is not for you to have a train wreck. His highest value for you is for you to know him. Amen. And for you to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's how you glorify the Lord. Not through skillfully avoiding falling down. He says, uh, even if you fall down, you ain't going to stay there. So just go. But Lord, this way is scary, and I gotta, I gotta try and traverse all this mess, and I don't know what I'm gonna do. He says, "Look, even if you fall, you ain't gonna stay there." That's what the word says, right? Guys, I have to go on to the third one, and the third one is this: Once he went, once he took him to the place and said, "Where did you lose it?" Be real with me and tell me what happened. This is what happened. He says, okay, now I'm going to show you something that works. And now you're, you're going to look at that. And then when this crazy miracle starts to happen and it begins to actually float in the same exact environment where it sank, 
then you got to reach out and grab it. I ain't going to grab it for you. It's up to you. Okay, whenever I make a way for you to finally go to college because that's been your dream and now you see that there's a way, here's the deal. Are you ready? You're going to have to do it. It's not enough that I gave that to you. You reach out and you put your hands on it and you possess it. And if you don't do that, then you can stand there beside the place where you've always lost it and say, Bed, oh, I hate that day. I wish that hadn't happened. I said, look, I caused that thing to float for you. But you didn't have the courage because you were scared of the water. Reach out and grab it. Tell the person next to you, tell them, say, reach out and grab it. Possess the land. It's not enough to see the promised land. Listen, you have to possess it. Moses saw it, but Joshua possessed it. Oh, I like that. If God gives you peace, if God's like, here you go, here's peace. It doesn't mean that you have peace unless you actually possess it. You're going to have to get it. You're going to have to conform your life to the image, uh, to the image of God's plan. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to wrap your head around it. You're going to have to say, I'm all the way in. I'm reaching. I'm grabbing this thing, and I ain't never letting go. Yeah. So here's the three. Locate where you lost it. Focus on what does work in that place, the Word, His Spirit, and reach out and take it when it's offered. And guys, that is the Word of King Jesus. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to ask everybody to stand up. While you guys are stand up, I'm going to say a great big goodbye to all my friends down in Houston. I'm going to turn it back over to the house. Houston, I love you guys and call you guys blessed.